welcome to this talk on functional programming in .NET. In this talk, we're going to be covering immutability, making invalid state unrepresentable, some problems with object-oriented architecture, and how to resolve these problems. Let's kick off with immutability. What does this mean in programming? One way of thinking about it is it's where all your values are read-only. So node array.push or person.firstname equals Everything is read-only. Let's try this out together with a code challenge. If we're going to count all the even numbers between 0 and x, we might loop and sum them this way. But can you think of an immutable way to do this, where you're not modifying the value of a variable? Pause the video now and have a try. Here's one way. We instantiate an enumerator which can generate values between 0 and x. Then we add a filter to pick out the even ones. And lastly, we generate and sum them. And we can represent this in a simpler, fluent way, like this. I feel it's a little simpler than the mutable version, as your eyes don't have to read around so much to keep track of what's happening for the total. Let's try a different one. In this one, how can we uppercase everyone's name in this collection of people? Pause the video now and have a try. Here's one attempt, again using an affluent approach. You might notice that while the mutable version allowed us to mutate the original input's objects pretty easily, the immutable one's select statement encourages us instead to create a copy of the people with data. This might seem unnecessary additional heavy lifting, but it actually turns out to be a good thing. To find out why, let's have a look at some fundamental concepts we have of reality. Did you realize that everything you do is forever? You can never change it. You may be sitting on a chair. You can't undo that. You can't delete it. You can stand up, but you haven't changed the fact you were sitting on a chair, or that perhaps you're now standing. Those things are both immutable. It's the same with everything in time. You can't change it. So modeling things immutably allows us to model them closer to how they are in real life. But more than that, it also increases readability and testability. So how does immutability help readability? Let's say you have a person class and you raise an event saying a particular instance of your person has been selected. And it's all great until someone else modifies your instance in their handler. Yikes. Now to read your own class's state, you'll need to check all your event handlers for edits like this. Or worse, I can remember. So with immutability, none of those event params would be editable. And so it helps readability because you don't have to reason about side effects. So it reduces what we call cognitive load. In the same way, immutability improves code testability. Say you have something like this and your tests look like the code at the bottom of the slide. It may be an arbitrary example, but we've all seen classes like this, where the state one method leaves a mutable variable impacts the success of another method. If I call list all users before list basket items, it will fail because these methods share a context. With immutability, all values, including shared context, are read-only, so no one can pull out the rug from or change your state under you. Now this is beginning to indicate the larger problem, that shared mutable state is a bad idea. But we all know that, right? Global state is bad. It's a given. No one uses global state. But you see, what we were looking at earlier is that code complexity introduced by shared global state is no worse than that introduced by shared class state. Both current user and items are external to the addBasket methods and can be modified during the execution of these methods by concurrent executions or subfunctions. And although add multiple items to basket can use add item to basket, it can also access the items collection directly. And there is nothing preventing it from having its own contract of logic with that internal state and having multiple paths depending on the call order. But seriously, how bad could this get? Well, here's an example from the system.xml namebase, the XML document. This has over 60 methods, events, and properties. Some of the state is private, some internal, and there's much more than that. This is a trim set of the state. So many dependent properties, 
So many things that need to be checked and looked after. Do you have an idea how much cognitive load a class like this would take to build, let alone test? How would you exhaustively assert that every order of execution in this class has been tested? There are more alternative permutations than grains of sand on the beach. And what if you could add partial classes into that mix, or inheritance? What contract do you even have around state at that point? And if this wasn't scary enough, it gets even worse with IOC, where class-level state is often lifted into globals, accessible by all classes instantiated by the IOC container. You see, object-oriented design requires mutability to even work. And this requirement brings a possibility of passing that mutable state externally via event args or sharing it across methods within a class. This in turn encourages method coupling via the shared state, where the method order is important, and this adds more to the cognitive load. Further, with object-oriented design, although you can mark methods as private and protected, this is often overrided by the need for simple testing, where you end up making the methods public just to test them. So what on earth do we do about this? The root of the problem of coupling is mutability, and although object-oriented design is built on mutability, we still need to address this root problem. We've seen how much immutability helps, but if we try to leverage it in object-oriented design, we can't mutate state anymore, and so immutability stops classes from working. Does this lead us to an impasse? As we saw, the cognitive load from mutation in object-oriented design, which we often don't call out because we're just accustomed to it, is a problem, and it would be a good idea to get rid of. So let's extract that mutable state so that the state is in one place and the methods in another. But still, because of value dependency between those state fields, the basket isn't totally safe. So let's make it safer. Great, now the basket state can be made safe, perhaps validated during construction, and the methods, now static, do not share this state but instead return it. This is a much safer way to build systems, with less coupling and dependencies. But I'd like to take this a bit further, as I think we're beginning to see the amount of syntax c -sharp requires just to get immutability to work. So for the next part of this talk, let's put constraints aside and see what it would be like to build our own new theoretical language that simplified immutability back into being usable again. Bear with me here, I'm going somewhere practical. It's just helpful to put constraints aside for the sake of a thought experiment. So let's revise our basket in our new, simpler, immutable by default language. And in our new language, because we can't have classes with mutable state anymore, let's change those keywords to make it a bit more obvious. And remove the boilerplate as much as possible. So if state is external, then everything that's not inside your function can be public. We'll also use constants instead of variables to enforce immutability. The braces are a form of boilerplate too as we're indenting for readability anyway, so we can lose those in the semicolons and just use the indent to show where scope starts and stops. I'll keep them on the type though, because we may want to define data types on a single line. Is this making the code simpler? Well, there's less to write for sure, but what I'm heading at here is domain-driven design code. Code without lint that can be read by non-coding product specialists. Domain-driven design tends to focus our thought on the value we're providing rather than the code. So in our new language, let's prioritize the domain instead of the types. See how we have the domain first and the types last now? This will help us focus on the domain as primary and the types as subservient to it. This approach is functional programming in domain-driven design and the convention for that is camel case. So let's do it. Now, the data being passed in is way too general. Using primitives for my data means I have to validate it at the start of every single method. I could, by accident, pass in user.firstname here, or my son's Christmas list in as the product ID, and the compiler wouldn't notice. So let's use domain-driven design to constrain the values even further. Now, we've defined some types that will be clearer to the developer and can only be passed in as values if they're marked as those types. And this will help us when refactoring, because if we're talking about a product ID, we'll only be able to assign an actual product ID to it 
We're seeing that baking immutability in DDD deep into a language has helpful side effects in that DDD can make your code more to the point and immutability makes it more testable and readable. Let's think about some other assertions we could add to protect against bugs. What's the one runtime bug, the one runtime exception that you probably see most of? Often in the form of some value being null, but more broadly, something being in a state where an operation that the compiler is okay with cannot actually be performed on the runtime data. So can we protect against this? Sure, we're making our own language, right? Let's add some protection by making it impossible to represent invalid state. We'll start off with getting rid of nulls. How do we do that? We can disallow nulls at a compiler level, thanks to newer versions of .NET. But in the case that we actually want to represent various value options within a single type, such as a status or an emptyable string or a result, we can use something called a discriminated union. A discriminated union is a powerful metatype which allows you to say a value is this or that. In TypeScript, we write it like this. So let's bring this into our new language too, but with even better support. There. Usually, we'd need to check current authority was not null first, but because null is not permitted in our language, we don't need to. And because we're going to have built-in support for union types, let's say that match is always exhaustive and will raise a compile error if you don't cover all the cases, or if you add a case that isn't supported in the type. Also, our new language can have type safe support for values. You see those X's? Within the match branch, they'll be typed as the known value of that case. So in our new language, you can't have nulls, you can't write to shared state, you can't access invalid state. And so there are a whole range of errors that can't even happen. Now, another thing we noticed about coding immutably in C sharp was that methods turned from this into this. So a byproduct of immutability is that all your methods either have a side effect or return, never both nor neither. Because they can't mutate parameters or global state, this return or side effects style makes them a bit easier to read. And it's actually a common pattern called CQS. And because side effects aren't great, we're likely to return almost everywhere now. So the return keyword becomes cruft. Let's get rid of it. I know it looks a bit weird, but it does grow on you. So let's take this to the next level. Why don't we say that everything has to return? And by everything, I mean methods, same as C-sharp, assignments like x equals 10, which will return, same as C-sharp. Switch statements must return, like C-sharp's new switch expressions. And if statements and while loops, etc., conditional logic. This is like having all statements being ternaries or link statements and forces all branches of the if statement to have the same effect because it has the same return. So we can assign a value like normal or to the result of an if statement. Here's an example with an else if or the result of a switch statement. Now the byproduct of everything returning and there being no nulls is that you get exhaustivity checking built in and you have fewer dead code paths since the compiler can check that all your candidate paths are used and either pre-compile fixed values or trim dead branches. And there's one last thing about immutability in this correlative approach we're taking. There's this thing called partial application, also called currying because it's named after a guy called Haskell Curry, whose ideas help shape what it is today. Partial application means that you can take a method like this with a single blob of input args and split up its blob of input args into separate blobs like this. So that if you only fill in a few of them, here I'm not passing the basket parameter, it affects my return type, and instead of a basket, I get a function that takes a basket and produces a new basket, so that I can call it to add a product to the basket. And another way of writing this would be to use what we call a pipe operator, a bit like in Bash or PowerShell. Now this uses a convention, the parameters I can skip start from the right working left, and the same with the values I pipe in right working left. It's possible to do it by name too, but for this example, it's by ordinal. This is really powerful and starts to dig into what functions are really made of, that they're not just lines of code, but sequential chains of functions.
We can dive deeper into this on a separate talk, but what it means is that there can be a heap of really powerful base libraries built in and external that all support this partial application pattern, which means you can write code that chains smaller partially applied functions together. And that reads quite simply. Here I'm mapping all the items in an ienumerable to an ienumerable of prices and then summing those together. Or here I'm getting an ienumerable of discounted items categories. Using these pre-made or library functions obviously saves bug fixing and it also focuses your code to just the business or domain data. Less lint means easier to read code. It encourages dry too. So with our new language, we've got something which is closer to DDD, has immutability baked into the language. Data and function are separated. Invalid state is impossible to represent, which means there are no more null and everything returns so that there are no dead code paths, and we have partial application, or currying. Now let's also throw in language support for reactive programming, observables and streams, type inference, lightweight async, and even more support for union types, something called continuations or computation expressions. You may be wondering what I'm getting at. Unfortunately, this has already been built. It ships with Visual Studio, it's called F Sharp. So the good news is you can use this right away in your projects. F Sharp is part of the .NET framework, so you can make a new F Sharp project and write code exactly like in this talk right now. And it'll interact both ways seamlessly with all your existing C Sharp projects. I really encourage you to try it out. Because it's part of .NET, it uses all the tried and tested .NET framework classes, but you can use them in a more immutable, functional and domain-driven manner. If you're interested in learning more, there are some good courses on Pluralsight and other training sites, and you should check out a great site called F Sharp for Fun and Profit. Plus, I'd be happy to point you towards more resources if you like. So this is the main take home. This talk has really been about the advantages of immutability and how OO frameworks can influence you away from it, but also how that when you see this, you can start to question some of the underlying assumptions of the language and end up somewhere really good. I'm not saying you should all swap from C sharp to F sharp at all, although I think that would be great and a really good move. But we can right now try to code more immutably within whatever language we use, and our code readability, testability, and release cadence can benefit from it. Thanks for listening.